Welcome to topic 5 in MATE 210 on electrical behavior and diffusion. In this topic we're going to talk about the proper electrical properties of materials including metals, insulators, and semiconductors and we'll talk about how we can manipulate those electrical properties through a process called diffusion. Let's get started. First of all our big picture again. So once again remember composition and processing together determine the structure of a material and the structure determines that material's performance. Well, processing in this case is microfabrication. Microfabrication is the process of making very small devices on silicon wafer chips. This is how we make computer chips, solar cells, and a number of other products. In order to do microfabrication, we have to take advantage of what's called the diffusion mechanism. And the diffusion mechanism is the way in which atoms move around within a solid metal, or a solid, any material for that matter. And finally, we'll look at electrical behavior in terms of electrical properties and how they're influenced by the diffusion process. First, let's look at an application, and I'd like to look at photovoltaic cells, or solar cells as they're more commonly known. On a bright day, approximately 1,000 watts of energy per square meter falls onto the Earth's surface on average. We'll see in a moment that that's not quite accurate for where we live, but on average, that's about the amount of energy the Earth receives. Now, the advantages of solar energy is that it's cheap, clean, and secure. We don't have to um, get our energy from other countries in the world if we had solar energy completely. Most solar, solar cells today are made from a silicon-based semiconductor, which you can see in the picture on the left, the upper left. But new technology arrives every day, and there's now a flexible solar cell material called pentacene, which in theory could be wrapped around telephone poles, put on the roofs of cars, and used in all kinds of applications. Right now it's rather expensive and so it hasn't been used widely. So how do solar cells work? Well the basic idea is that you have two types of semiconductors. An n-type silicon semiconductor layer on top, a p-type silicon semiconductor on the bottom, and that when a photon from the sunlight strikes those that junction, or what's called the NP junction, you get electrical current flowing through the semiconductor. We'll talk more about what an N-type silicon semiconductor and a P-type silicon semiconductor are later in this topic. So here's a map of the solar radiation on the, uh, in the United States. And as you can see, in slow, we get about 5,000 to 6,000 watts per square meter. So that's quite a bit higher than the, national, uh, the uh, global average. Where I used to live in Michigan, it's much lower, typically around 2,000 to, 2, to 2,500 watts per square meter. Keep in mind that there are parts of the Earth that see very low levels of solar irradiation because of the angle they are to the sun. Oh, one thing I wanted to mention about this is that because of this high solar irradiation in the southwest, solar, um, solar cells make a lot of sense economically. But when you move into areas like the eastern United States where there's much less solar irradiation, it doesn't make as much sense to use solar cell technology. Another problem with solar cells is their efficiency. If we look at um, solar cells, which silicon solar cells, which are the red symbols, we'll notice that they typically have laboratory-based efficiencies between about, starting in the mid-1980s, of around 18% up to today when the in the year 2000 and later we're probably pushing 25 percent efficiency that's not very good considering that most thermodynamic systems push 35 percent efficiency and given that sil silicon based sol solar cells are expensive we prefer to have a higher efficiency for that co cost also keep in mind that it depends on the nature of the silicon that we're using so if we use single crystal silicon, which is more expensive to produce, we can get higher efficiencies than if we use polycrystalline, the open squares, which has lower efficiency but is cheaper to manufacture. There are other options available to us besides silicon. We could, for example, use copper-based selenides, which are the blue and purple circles. We could use cadmium telluride, which is another low-efficiency solar cell material. But these uh, elements are not in great quantities compared to silicon and so probably don't represent a future technology that we're likely to pursue. Another option is to use amorphous silicon so that it doesn't have a crystal structure. This is very easy to produce and very cheap but is also the, the least efficient of all types of silicon based solar cells. 
Recently, the trend has been towards what are called multi-junction concentrators. These have two or three junctions between an N and a P-type semiconductor. Um, they involve more complicated material selection and more advanced manufacturing, but as you can see from the graph, given the triangles, we can get uh, significantly higher efficiencies with these types of solar cells. Now, why are solar cells so inefficient? The answer has to do with the spectra of light that's striking the solar cell and the way that the solar cell interacts with that light. It turns out that there's basically two broad ranges of light coming into the solar cell. Low energy infrared light, which comes in at long wavelengths, and high energy blue light coming in at shorter wavelengths. Now the blue light is absorbed by the solar cell, but some of that energy is lost in the form of thermal radiation, or heat. And the infrared light actually passes right through the solar cell and isn't even collected. So there's a large quantity of energy, both the infrared light passing through and the heat lost, that's never collected and turned into electricity. And that's the reason that uh, we have low efficiency in solar cells. We'll talk about electrical behavior in the